Hi, this is Andrew, and this is Keynote, the daily now.tv chat show with some of the world's leading thinkers and writers. Hello, everybody. It is Sunday, September the 10th, 2023. We've done lots of shows on feminism recently. And one, uh, uh, one writer, Kyla Schuler, offers a counter history to what she calls white feminism. Uh, she had a new book out, The Trouble with White Women. She was, in a sense, I guess, breaking free of traditional feminism. And my guest today is formally breaking free of feminism, or at least the idea of equality. Uh, and in fact, her new book is called Breaking Free, The Lie of Equality and the Feminist Fight for Freedom. Uh, Marcy Bianco is based in Palo Alto, just down the peninsula from San Francisco. And the book is just out. Uh, Marcy, congratulations on the new book. I think I probably made an error in the sense that um, you're not breaking free I'm guessing a feminism. You're breaking free of the idea or the lie of, of equality, and you see equality and feminism as contradictory. Is that fair? I think that's fair in terms of how I how I arrive at my definition of, of feminism and specifically through freedom. So thank you, Andrew, for having me on this show. Um, I see equality feminism as the type of feminism that has dominated uh, the U.S. feminist political movement since its inception in the mid-19th century. And as a result, women, and I think everyone, frankly, who lives within a patriarchal world, right, or a white supremacist patriarchal world, is really suffering from the principles and values of a gender binary and of the patriarchy that really hem us into um, certain boxes that don't really help us live meaningful, joyful lives and have us really fighting with each other when we should really be trying to free each other to create meaningful lives. So it's a it's an endeavor to break free of the equality mindset and of this kind of weddedness to equality um, in order to maybe think differently about how we can live daily in a way that shows care and respect for each other. So what does equality feminism, Marcy, means? You say it goes back to the middle of the 19th century. Is that a traditional well, liberal feminism? I believe so. I mean, that, that would be my argument. We see it at the roots of the suffrage, the suffrage movement in the mid-19th century when you had um, mostly white women um, at the main at the mainstay that as figureheads, as conceived of as figureheads of the movement, even though as you referenced Kyla Schuller, we know that this is not the case. But this desire for the equal right to vote to men in order to create equal participation and equal status in society, we've seen how that has actually played out over time and how, you know, that equal right has really only been afforded to a select group of people. And in fact, that is true if you look at voting in particular, which is something I reference in the introduction of my book, is something very tangible to understand. The 15th and 19th Amendments, we have two constitutional amendments um, enshrining the constitutional right to vote, except you know if you're under the age of 18 and you've been incarcerated. And yet we have seen even since the 15th Amendment, when Black men were given the right to vote, a state-led and citizen-led effort to disqualify Black men from voting and to limit their voting, um, to create violence or to exact harm on Black men so that they do not vote. And we've seen that like enforced in, in laws. And we've seen that, I mean, even armed vigilantes at polling sites this past election, there was a concerted effort um, whether, you know, gerrymandering or these vigilantes to limit people from practicing that right. And so this is something else that I discuss in the book is the very real difference between a, an equal right in theory and an equal right in, in practice. And we've seen time and again how those are radically different from each other. Do you have examples from history of equal rights in practice as opposed to theory? What? social models are you using that they may not be ideal, but they may 
get closer than uh, uh, 21st century American? Well, it's really interesting because, you know, we do see how the equal or to vote when it is practiced. And we, we saw this the past month in local, you know, state, state and local elections. When people are able to practice a right, we can see change happen. Um, but equality hasn't really been the cure-all to mechanisms of oppression. Um, and really interestingly, maybe it's because of the, it's at the fore of my mind because of the U.S. Open and I'm a, I'm a tennis fan. We've seen a lot of discussion around um, equal prize money. It's been very carefully worded as equal prize money. But what's really interesting to me is that the women play best of three sets and the men play best of five sets. So if you add up, I mean, technically the, the work that's being done um, it's it's not equal, but you know, fair play to the women for essentially getting to earn more at the end um, by playing three best of three sets. You seem to present, and, and and correct me if I'm wrong, this equality feminism as a kind of ideological trick. Um, firstly, is that fair? And secondly, who's perpetrating this trick? Well, <laughs> um, that's an interesting turn of phrase. I guess I haven't really thought about it like that um, as a kind of trick, but I see um, that performativity and that trickster employment in terms of creating the mirage that it exists. And well, you, you say, like, sorry to jump in here. I mean, you yeah, say that um, it's, it's, and I'm quoting you, I think, from one of your pieces, uh, we sold feminism to the masses and now it means nothing. I mean, whether it's the feminism of equality, but it seems as if a lot of this stuff is, is selling an ideal, an empty ideal, mm -hmm. perhaps even worse than an empty ideal uh, to quote unquote the masses. Is that fair? I think that's fair enough. Yes. Marcy, some people might be listening and saying, yeah, maybe she has a point in some ways. And yet, since the 19th century, let's say over the last 200 years, the lives of women have changed dramatically. We're certainly mm -hmm. not ideal in any way. No one's going to pretend that it is. But mm -hmm. women now can vote. There are more women in, in work. You're living in Palo Alto. It's still, in some senses, a patriarchal world, but more and more women in universities. There are even some women... Uh, including my wife, had senior positions in big tech companies. So mm -hmm. would you acknowledge that? Or or is that a bit of a trick too? Oh, no, I absolutely acknowledge that. But my point is that not that, it, that rights do not matter. I very much say rights do matter. But we can't have this... Um, this belief, this idea that equality will be the cure-all to ending gender oppressions, which I think is what happens um, or what has happened. So there's this, this weddedness to this ideal, which we see play out, keeps falling short. I mean, I, I think of the United Nations making that declaration at the beginning of the year saying that we are quote unquote, 300 years away from gender equality, which to me connoted how fallacious it is because again even it exists in theory that means that in our daily lives i don't know exactly what it would mean to um wake up and feel equal or i don't know exactly what it would mean to wake up and and be equal because for example you know you mentioned your wife but that doesn't mean that she did not experience or have to do all that emotional labor of navigating those systems to get where she needed yeah, to no, go. Yeah, no, 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 I, I completely agree on that front. Yeah, I'm not presenting it in any way ideal. I'm, I'm simply suggesting that some people might say, well, Mars is right in some ways, and yet things have changed dramatically for women. I'm not just, yeah, I, I, I'm not arguing that at all. Instead, what I'm wanting to point out is that equality is an artifice. It is a construction that is only implemented through institutions that are fundamentally patriarchal. They were created hundreds of years ago by men for men, mostly, if not all, white men. And so what results is that if you put this ideal of equality through this system to exact equality in practice, it ends up looking very different. Um, and instead, what I really wanted to do was reimagine 
or think of what power do we do we have in our daily lives? Equality feels so out of reach, even the ERA, right? It, it, it feels like I, I call it an existing in a kind of Shakespearean limbo. It never seems to ever, it doesn't feel like it's going to happen really, at least. It's like the Brazilian economy. <laughs> Full of potential, never act, uh, never actualized. I wonder, Marcy, whether it's also having a corrosive impact on men. Um, we've done lots of shows, like with Richard Reeves, the Brookings Institute scholar, mm -hmm. on the cultural crisis, the psychological crisis of, of, of men. Do you think that equality feminism is having um, uh, a corrosive impact on men themselves, even if they are... I guess that, as you say, the perpetrators of equality feminism? Well, I think I would pinpoint that to the ideology of, of patriarchy rather than individual men, even though, as I say in the book, people do run and, you know, they have created our systems. They run and manage our systems. So these, these systems and institutions are autonomous. But interestingly, you know, this is something that Bell Hooks has pointed out, you know, pointed out throughout her her writings, her writing career is that we all live, all of us are affected by patriarchy. And if equality feminism has construed this politics in a very restrictive binary that sits men and women in opposition to each other, we end up fighting each other instead of trying to find ways to really work together and create new dynamic and meaningful relationships. And so, would I say that? Sure. I mean, I can see absolutely how certain efforts um, can be construed up very reductively and hem men into the gender binary just as much as they hem women into it and really like end up stereotyping men. Um, so I can see that. Yeah. We are talking with Marcy Bianco. She's the author of an interesting, intriguing, controversial new book, Breaking Free, The Lie of Equality and the Feminist Fight for Freedom. Take a short break. Uh... Beyond the news, the noise, there is nuance, insight. Liberties is not just a journal of ideas. It's a meteor of intelligent substance. It's the place to be for engaged citizens, Politics, opinion, substance. Liberties is a triumph for freedom of thought. A quarterly of urgency, of cultural exploration, of intellectual delight, of immaculate prose. It's invaluable. Subscribe now or find Liberties at your favorite bookseller. And you can learn more about Liberties at libertiesjournal.com. We are talking with Marcy, uh, Marcy Bianco, author of Breaking Free, uh, she wants to break free of equality feminism, and it's an interesting argument. So, Marcy, you mentioned uh, Bell Hooks earlier. Uh, she's clearly had an influence on you. Also, Audre Lorde, uh, another interesting thinker, poet. Mm -hmm. She comes up quite a lot in the shows, actually. Is there a, a, a school of anti-equality feminism? Wh where is all this coming from? You're not formally in the university uh, you work uh, as an editor on a, a publication that's attached to Stanford mm -hmm. University. But mm -hmm. is there a formal, shall we say, anti-equality feminist movement? I wouldn't say there is a formal one. And yeah, as I d identify in the book, there are various threads of feminist thinkers, activists, and I think also philosophers. I mean, you mentioned Bell Hooks and Audre Lorde were huge influences on my book and especially bell hooks ended up playing a much larger role um, than i guess i originally envisioned but her whole idea of destroying dualisms undergirds the work that i'm trying to do as well as her vision for creating shared bonds between women that aren't based in victimhood and that is another motivation of this book is to try to you know break free of that binary framing that creates women's political imperative from the position of victimhood, which is something that is connected to Bell Hooks' ideas. But also fundamentally, a lot of this work is based in, in Simone de Beauvoir's philosophy. Of right, freedom. I was going to bring and, up uh, the great de Beauvoir because she's in some ways the, if not the founder, certainly one of the most powerful voices in 20th century feminism. How, how, how do you think she would respond to your book? 
gosh, could I even conjecture? It feels so rude to <laughs> to make. Well, she's dead, so she won't be too upset. You can say whatever <laughs> you like about her. What, what, do you think that she would agree with you? I well, I use. I mean, I really rely on her understanding of freedom as a collective endeavor, and that our freedoms are situated such that in order to build our collective capacity, but also individual capacity for freedom, we need to be in the world, have encounters, have relationships with other people who are also free. So I, I'm hoping that she would appreciate um, my use of her ideas and my building upon her ideas. Um, that would be my- I, I think she oh. would. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you, you, you mentioned Audrey Lord. Um, you, you quote her in one of your pieces. Uh, uh, this is what she says. I am not free while any woman is unfree, even when her shackles are very different from my own. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting argument, but ultimately, is that ever conceivable? Isn't that a utopian idea of perfect freedom for everybody and suggesting that no one will ever be free until we get to this utopia? Mm, I don't know if I would necessarily say that because... First of all, you cannot, there's not an end game to freedom work. And there's not a, there's not, unlike equality, which, you know, equality feminism understands that once the, the right is won, then the fight is done. But rather as a, than as a final event or some kind of finality, freedom is always something. It's, it's a continuous process and practice. So it's a lifelong in, endeavor. Um, so I, I think I would push back against this idea of reaching this utopia because it's something that it, it never ends. This work never ends because we live in the world and the world changes daily and life moves on and, you know, we live within time. So we are always working to create our freedom and, and live lives that are meaningful. It's a daily practice. What's the relationship, Marcy, between freedom and happiness? We live, of course, in an age of anxiety, particularly yes, with some people. We've had lots of shows on that. Do you think the absence of um, of freedom um, is one reason for people's general misery these days? I would absolutely. That's a great. That's a a great question, and I think it's based on a really great observation, Andrew. I would say absolutely yes, and you know, uh, to a few reasons for that. I, I think we live in such an exploitative capitalist economy that people are just struggling to pay their rent, um, pay off their student loans, just stay afloat um, without, you know, working themselves to death. And also I think because of the emergence of the digital age and what we've seen increasingly over the years is this chipping away of, uh, privacy, which in a, in a way is an aspect of, of freedom. So, I mean, I know my anxiety has increased <laughs> exponentially in the, in the past couple of years, especially because of the, the pandemic. And I think we've not within this country, but also globally, I would argue we've not um, paused and reflected upon the tragedy and the immense um, suffering that has transpired in the past couple of years, especially within the, the healthcare industry. I think about all of those nurses, all of those doctors, all of the hospital staff that had to endure regardless of their own lives and, and try to take care of, of all of us. And sometimes I sit and think, you know, what kind of care are they receiving? What kind of, you know, therapy are they receiving to process what they had to do the past couple of years and continue to have to do because we still do live within, you know, there's still an ongoing pandemic, whether we want to acknowledge it or not. Marcy, I, I was reading one of your pieces uh, in Quartz, um, and I'm quoting you here. You talk about visibility filtered through capitalism does not necessarily further the cause. You also wrote feminism's recently skyrocketing, sky, sky not sky rotting sky rocketing profile is a reminder that the best way to constrain the power of a social movement is to commodify it right reading some of your work suggests to me and again I'm, i hope i'm not putting words into your mouth no, it's that okay 
you don't think that women can be free in capitalism. Is that fair? You know what I will say, and I do say this in the book, capitalism is a bit of a bugbear for me on this book because I, I think I would argue, and I do, I think I do argue that within capitalism, it's very, very hard to within um, organizations and institutions cultivate a freedom when those organizations and institutions are driven by profit rather than care. Uh, so yes, but at the same time, what I really focus on and what I try to emphasize is that freedom is a daily practice. So even within our daily lives, even within our situated freedom, as Simone de Beauvoir says, right, whereby all of us have, you know, come from different backgrounds, have different desires, dreams, ambitions, uh, different economic conditions, our freedoms are situated. Um, and within that situated freedom, we can actually every day, uh, sit and think and reflect on our place in, that, in the world, create that awareness, use a critical consciousness, and think about how we want to live our values in the world. And I think that space, even for some people, it might be uh, really minute, really, really finite. There is still that space of power to think about how you're going to act in the world. And so part of this is, you know, how can we make the personal, um, or how is the personal political through a freedom mindset? And I really, my hope is that, you know, when women or anyone, when anyone reads this book, that they see that their daily choices, daily actions, how they live their values in the world that, you know, create some kind of integrity or draw a line of integrity for them, that is within their grasp. And to me, that is where freedom on that individual level lay, lies. Yeah, you wrote... Um... Movement building means building movement, which I'm guessing is 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 what you're saying. So, so to conclude, Marcy, for people watching this, they they might think, um, I think she has a point here. Um, she's right, but um, it seems rather abstract, quite philosophical. What should people do? I mean, not everyone has the luxury of working on magazines and 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 reading all these. Mm -hmm. uh, sophisticated thinkers like Audre Lorde and de Beauvoir and Bell Hooks. How can you, you, you touched on it earlier, but how can people begin to change their lives within structures that aren't quite right and probably are never going to change, certainly in mm -hmm. the next few years? Mm -hmm. uh, how can you be against equality feminism um, without... Uh, how, how can you fight equality feminism without dedicating your entire life to it? How can you make yourself happier? Well, you you raised several points that I'll try to get to quickly because of time. One, the endeavor of this book was to write a general ideas book for a general audience. And I think plenty of those ideas books exist. And yet when it comes to feminism, it's construed as being too abstract or too philosophical. But as you noted, I'm no longer in academia. So I really endeavored to make these ideas accessible. And in the Lynch, in the, the hinge chapter of this book, A Vision for Freedom, I talk about how the first point of practice or entry is claiming it, is activating it, but it's it means everyone again sit and reflect and become aware of their situatedness in the world. And I think everyone can do that. I mean, Malcolm X wrote about this. Well, he didn't write his autobiography, but he talks about being in prison and finding freedom within the very limited conditions of his life. So it's thinking, what is my situatedness? How do I live my values? And how do I wanna live my values to create a world that is based in respecting one another that is based in caring for one another as much as possible. And accountability is par a part of that because accountability I think is a, is a care practice. And also to the point of, again, equality, you know, I respect feminism, feminists, you know, today who are fighting for the ERA. I, I do, and I, again, wanna make that clear. I, it's not that I think rights are not important, but I don't think they're going to allow us to create the lives of our dreams. And, you know, that's a bit idealistic, but hey, I got to find idealism somewhere. Yeah, well, I, you've just given me the title uh, of the piece, uh, Marcy, Creating Lives of Our Dreams. Is that, 
Is that really what you're in the business of? Is that what breaking free can result in? I think a part of that is that is part of the idealism of this book. Yeah, absolutely.